Thank you all so much for joining us today for our first webinar for Elder Health. My name is Dr. Prim Self, founder of Elder Health, and I'm here with our wonderful Elder Health team. And today we're going to be talking to you about how to manage behaviors of a loved one with neurocognitive disorders. We invite you first and foremost to reframe behaviors as communication of an unmet need. That no one simply has behaviors, but everyone has needs. And additionally, that the behavior is not likely meant to make another's life more difficult, but rather an attempt to gain one's attention of an unmet need, such as pain or needing to use the bathroom. We would like to um, also mention two books um, and give credit to two authors that we um, used in preparation for this webinar. One of them is The Dementia Concept by Joshua J. Freitas. And one of them is I'm Still Here by John Diesel. Let's get started today by introducing our panel, the Elder Health team. I'll just introduce their names and then they'll do a short introduction. Peggy Schmidt, nurse practitioner, Laura Almer, licensed clinical social worker, and Melissa Kuhn, nurse practitioner. Peggy can go first. So, <clears throat> Uh, my name is Peggy, and I have been dealing in geriatrics um, since I was a nurse and started doing uh, Medicare home health. So then 20 years ago, when I became a nurse practitioner, I knew that geriatrics was what I really wanted to do. And so I have done that for the last 20 years as a nurse practitioner. And I come from it from a place where uh, a personal place, my father was diagnosed with early onset dementia. Um, just as I graduated from nursing school, and he lived for another 30 years. So it was quite a journey in, as a family um, to deal with this when Alzheimer's wasn't a buzzword like it is today. Laura. Thank you, Peggy. Uh, my name is Laura Almer, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker with an advanced certification in palliative and hospice care. And in preparation for this webinar, as I was reflecting on my 20 years as a social worker, I recognized so many threads that were being pulled toward my current role with elder health. Um, I was thinking about my choice in graduate school to focus on the field of geriatrics. I was thinking about uh, many personal experiences like Peggy also referenced where um, I deepened my commitment to supporting and guiding caregivers who may be caring for someone with a neurocognitive or other serious or chronic mental or physical illness. Um, my time at the Veterans Health Administration when I lived in Richmond, Virginia, as well as a certification I earned in pastoral care and counseling. So I was thinking about all these threads, how they just got stitched together and they really inform my heart and my calling as a social worker. Um, I actually started my career out in pediatrics, uh, nowhere near geriatrics, <laughs> but uh, surprisingly, and I went through pediatrics and OBGYN and then on to family medicine and then um, hospice and palliative care. But like Laura was saying, um, you can look back through my experience and everything kind of came to where we are today and where my, my interest lies is in behaviors is what we're talking about today, because you see that throughout everything. And it is, it is about learning how people communicate. So despite what, what area of medicine you're in, when you come into the, when you're seeing, see a patient, you're, you're learning how to interpret their communication as well. So, um, I think all of those different places in my life has brought me to here and glad to have like minds with me. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you all. Thank so you. if we could get started today, panelists, by helping give to give us a framework of how we can understand and reframe our own perception and our own behaviors when we start to think about helping to care for a loved one. And um, that brings us to the path for our discussion today, which is gonna have three basic stepping stones. 
understanding, communication, and engagement. And essentially, the more we understand about the primary symptoms of neurocognitive disorders, uh, the better chance we have to understand what someone is trying to communicate. As a result of changes in the brain, a person's behavior will change over time. And as I was you know, preparing and writing out my remarks for our webinar today, I stopped and, and reread that statement or that sentence a couple of times. And at first I said, boy, what, what a simple, straightforward thing. Changes in the brain are gonna cause a person's behaviors to change. And then I stopped for a moment and I realized how much more complicated and emotionally charged that is to accept really that someone that we know and love is going to change um, in ways that we're not able to control for the most part and in ways that we may not understand. So it really, it gave me pause for a moment to really connect back and remember that there is a large chasm between the intellect you know, and the heart of understanding. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention here as well, even though this is an entirely different webinar uh, that maybe we would have for future, which would be about caregiver feelings um, and the emotional landscape, but just to say how important it is to find a safe space or a trusted person where you can have your own feelings validated essentially about these losses and about these changes. Because then in a way you're building your strength, your emotional strength to um, carry through on this journey. Uh, with this in mind, we begin to realize that relationships are going to need to change and adjust. Right, in ways that provide opportunities to improve the quality of our connections. And that brings us to the se second stepping stone for today, connections. Um, and connections can happen in verbal and nonverbal ways. Connections incorporate the physical, the social, the emotional, the spiritual, uh, the cognitive, all those different pieces um, which really bring to the forefront this idea that we are talking about something that is holistic in nature. So not just looking at a person from one angle or a situation from one way, it's all of these pieces together. And forming and deepening these connections utilizes knowledge we have about the person we love and care for, their essence, you know, those essential qualities that we know and love about someone on most days <laughs> and on other days that what we love to hate perhaps, um, but in any, in any way, there's their qualities that make them who they are, um, who they were, what they did in the past, what activities or moments brought them joy. Once again, as I was kind of writing out and getting prepared for today, um, Kathleen, my mother-in-law, came to mind and she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and she loved to read to children. In fact, it became something that she ended up uh, volunteering for. It was a service that she volunteered for. And a favorite book of hers was The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein and some of you know this book. And this book became a source of comfort for my mother-in-law um, as her disease progressed. And it was a way for our family to connect and engage with Nana um, when other channels have been blocked. So engagement, that becomes our third stepping stone for today. And as you'll see, it'll kind of lay out, but by providing interesting and engaging experiences such as through music, art, structure, routine, we begin to speak the language with the most open channels, or at least the most opportunity for open channels and environments. And then environments are created that help to reduce or eliminate 
these secondary behavioral symptoms that we're going to go over in more detail. Um, and finally, I just want to say, as we met as a team to prepare for today's webinar, we thought it was important to note that today's discussion is not meant to be a crash course of information towards understanding or even a one size fits all guide. Um, because each person and each situation and each caregiver is unique. And if I think about myself, you know, how I understand or learn best or when something clicks is different for each of us. So allow your knowledge to build over time in small pieces. Um, try and make sense um, of what you hear today that might um, resonate with you and discard the rest. You know, or maybe put it up on the shelf for another time when all of a sudden you say, that's you know, what I was hearing. Thank you. I'm wondering if we can move forward by explaining exactly how neurocognitive disorders impact people's behaviors. So I, one of the things that I think all of us have seen and anyone who's dealt with um, memory is um, short-term memory loss happens kind of in the beginning usually, often associated with word finding. Um, sometimes, you know, these things progress, but, you know, sometimes people forget to pay their bills. They have problems with... Um, they're finding when they're driving, they get lost when they're driving. They have often a loss of sense of time. Um, you know, there's many different variations of this and behavioral things, but the other issue that is quite common a little bit later on is around sundowning, which we really don't know very much about. But for whatever reason, light changes, and that seems to be a trigger for people to sometimes have some behavioral um, problems at that time. Um, oftentimes, there's problems with sleep, and sleep deprivation is an issue um, with cognitive um, diseases. So I think those are some of the um, biggest ones. I mean, people lose memory, they have impaired judgment. Um, and it's, it's a progressive thing. So it starts out little and it's kind of insidious. Um, it's easy to miss the beginnings of these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that with behaviors, again, it's a, it's a form of communication that maybe even we all use these different forms too to communicate things. Um, so if you even step back into your own life and say, you know, how, how do you feel like I can remember very, very vividly when I was pregnant and just didn't want anybody to touch me. I probably came across <laughs> agitated, but I didn't necessarily tell people I'm agitated. I just, it was, you know, you, you act in ways that um, give people information that's not necessarily from your logical side of your brain and, and giving that information. So when, when we look at people with dementia, again, there, there's going to be these, these symptoms that come up, um, but most notably, they, they may be agitated and agitated and irritable. They, they may say cuss words. They're not used to saying cuss words. They may throw things. They may, and again, like the sundowning thing, it could be anxiety or just that repetitive questions that what time is it? And then what time is it? And when you see those, those behaviors start to come, you have to look at the bigger picture. You can continue to answer the same question, or you can say, what is happening? What's going on? Especially if you see a pattern start to come um, forth. In fact, uh, just this morning, and my father's on this webinar, and just this morning, um, he was explaining my, he's, my, my mamma, uh, who lives with them, my dad and my mom in Mississippi, is, is struggling with this. And he was saying that every time the caregiver leaves at 3.30, my mama thinks she has to leave too. So she goes out and starts walking up and down the road. And I was explaining to him that I, me and Laura had had another situation very similar to this, where a man, every time the caregiver left, he went with her and took all the other residents with them. And what we learned was it was just the way you said goodbye. The caregiver says, 
goodbye and they think they're going too. So what we did was we taught the caregiver um, in, that, in that facility to not do that, it's do more of a soft, soft goodbye. Mm -hmm. And what happened was he didn't roll anybody out in the hallway anymore. He didn't try to leave with her because in his mind, that the caregiver came back in the next day, it was all one, one circle of time. So you don't have, you have, it's little things that can change, make big differences. Um, my other favorite story is from um, when I worked in Zawali, Louisiana, I, had a, I did nursing home rounds and we had a gentleman who was African-American and every, every day he would, at 12 o'clock, he'd go around and, and urinate in other people's plants. And this was just driving the staff insane. And I was a brand new to being a nurse practitioner at this time, but they had tried every drug on their son. This man could still get up and go with the plants. So we, we exhausted all options. And finally, I sat down with his wife and said, you know, what could be bothering him? And it turns out after a lot of investigating and talking and getting to know the family, this man does not like gospel music. And every day at, during the lunch hour, they would play gospel music. And he would go around and, and that was his way. He couldn't express, he didn't like it, but that was his way of saying, hey, this is not for me, I don't like it. So they got him headphones and we played music that he liked in his headphones while everybody else listened to gospel music and he stopped. Um, so again, you, you have to look at the person as a whole and kind of see what's going on in the situation. So we're going to give you more tips as we go forward. Yeah, I think this might also be a good time to just talk about physical needs. That oh, might be going yes. I kind of got off the topic there, but yes, physical needs. First thing you want to do if, if your loved one is having behaviors, especially if they were doing okay and this something changed. Um, but cross off all the things that could be happening. You know, is the room too hot? Is the room too cold? I mean, adjusting the temperature, but they did a whole study with dementia patients and the temperature in the room and decreasing agitation. So sometimes it's very simple, um, but you wanna, are they hungry? Are they thirsty? Do they need to go to the bathroom and they can express that to you? Um, again, you, you look for all the normal things that could be happening. Is the main one I wanna bring up is pain. Pain is often mm -hmm. overlooked because when you ask a patient that has dementia, are you hurting? Their, their default response is to say no. I mean, again, that's what comes natural, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're not having pain. Um, specifically, apathy, aggression um, are two of the symptoms that we're gonna talk about today that directly relate to pain. Those are definitely things that you see when there may be an underlying cause of, of uncontrolled pain. Um, so always want to eliminate all of the organic causes that could be causing the, the behaviors. That's perfect. This is a perfect chance to move into talking about the four A's of mm -hmm. Alzheimer's and how we can use those to meet our loved one's needs and better understand, you know, to connect and engage. Uh, yes. And when we're talking about those four A's, we're talking about agitation, anxiety, aggression, and apathy. Sort of the four uh, main um, behaviors that arise. So Melissa and I are just gonna kind of go through, um, give a brief explanation of what the symptom is, what the behavior looks like, and then some responses. So with agitation, um, what is really happening as a symptom is that lack of ability to self-initiate activities. So if you recall, in the beginning, we talked about the changes in the brain, which are going to affect um, being able to do that. And then the behavior, what comes out or what can manifest can be a restlessness, it can be repeated actions, it can be nonstop talking. So as a result of this inability to self-initiate, you have this resulting behavior. Um, Melissa, you have, you know, we've had over of the time working together, some good ways non-pharmacologically to sort of address that. Could you Certainly. talk about? So with apathy, again, you've got to know your, your person. Well, this is agitation. Oh, yeah. Agitation, you've got to know your person yeah, too. With all of them. So <laughs> if you're starting to see things, certainly one way to meet them where they are is, is speak to them through their sensory needs. Um, and so we borrow from the sensory deprivation uh, disorder in children, those same things happen in dementia. They're not getting to experience that those sensory needs too. 
Um, and I can, I, one of my favorite examples is we had a lady who um, had been institutionalized 10 years ago and she would walk through the, the same hallway. It's a concrete building, uh, had windows, but they ne she never went outside. She never knew, I mean, stayed in here. She would pick, take all the residents items with her and walk up and down the hall and one of the one time we we learned more about her we loved that she, we found out she loved to garden and so one day 10 years later we we took her outside barefoot in the grass and it, it was a remarkable experience and I just thought we don't think about that we don't think hey they've not felt grass on their feet um so it can be something very very simple that they're not getting enough stimulation and, and that's an easy thing to engage them with their senses um, one of the things that we really, really like is the, it's like the fidget blanket <clears throat> or the an apron. Um, just recently, we we purchased this for a lady, and we're gonna put things on the apron that you know that she will identify with. Um, you can put keys, or you can put little. We have other little gadgets that can be put on. Um, one of the things that we really like are the are the fidget dolls, or or also can be known as um, a comfort doll. Yes. And I feel like everybody needs a comfort. Laura's one of the ones that taught me this, that you need something tangible to hold. Um, and it may, it may sound childish, but I really encourage you if you don't, if your loved one doesn't have something that makes them feel good, this, this is something you need to put in place, figure out who they are, what they, what that item would be so that when they are scared or agitated, it's a way to communicate with you and say, oh, they're holding that, their doll or their, their blanket. And, there's some need that I need to address. Mm -hmm. um, so I might help to reduce some of that yeah, restlessness. For sure. Um, aggression you know, is another uh, behavior that's seen. And the symptom is essentially that inability to control one's own impulses. Um, so think about if there were changes that were not allowing you to hold back from doing something and you didn't necessarily understand what was happening to you. Um, you know, this is where you may strike out. And behaviors with aggression can take many forms. Could be shouting, um, which is sometimes an attempt to gain some attention. Again, back to what Dr. Self was talking about, the need. You know, what is the need um, that is trying to be met? Um, physical aggression, um, we often see this in our experience around the times of personal care. So if someone has an inability to control their impulses and they're not sure what's happening to them, that might be the way that they can protect themselves. Um, so with aggression um, and uh, the different ways they can manifest, we've also had some really interesting things. Uh, there was the one woman who was shouting all the time. What was that? Yes. She was, uh, we had a, a lady who, bless her, she would, um, she would just scream all the time and you couldn't, figure out what was wrong. We, we went through the list of if she was okay, she wasn't cold, she did she wasn't in pain. We we went through everything and she was so we decided and we think did, did she need to be right. with more people, right? So right. We, so we put her with more people. That caused screaming. That was worse. And then we took her away from people and put her in a room by herself and that caused screaming. So um you know it you you learn from your mistakes. So after all of those trials and error we talked to the daughter who said, you know, my mom is a librarian. So she needs people in her presence, but the stimulation of like going to the cafeteria or going out with a lot of people, having too much noise uh, was overkill. So the if we figured out, you know, she needs a lip people in in her presence, but maybe not the the busyness of a cafeteria. And, and again, it was a very simple thing to change in her routine that stopped the screaming and just knowing who she was and knowing what her day to day life was like before. We yeah. had the same story with the woman who uh, worked at the police was the operator. Oh, yeah. They had exactly. so she, she needed lots of stimulation all day. And yeah, ended up the turning on the TV and the radio. And, and you know, that was her calm. So, mm -hmm. and this is, you know, what we do as a team. Uh, and we also have had the honor to see it happening amongst families is that you're talking about and saying, uh, what can I think about and know about this person? Who were they? What are their routines and likes now? And you begin to kind of piece together um, what that need may be. Um, and that's something that we are constantly encouraging um, and working on in our practice. 
and seeing and borrowing from the stories that our families tell us as to how they um, overcame some of the, um, you know, the challenges and started to really understand and communicate better. And you might, um, you're probably going to get it. It's the same behavior is, and error, is, yeah. is not necessarily need the same intervention every time. So, right. you know, it, you, you kind of go back to the drawing board. You, you take your win for the day and then the next day is different. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's very, it can be very small, you know, moments. Um, just to stay for a moment on the aggression, maybe on personal care, um, talk a little bit about the poncho, the bath poncho, around, you know, maybe that idea of um, not knowing what's happening and not wanting to be um, completely undressed in front of someone. So, um, and, and then the dementia concept book, he does a good job of, of discussing this as well, is that people need about 15 minutes before an event occurs. Give them that 15 minutes of time before doing something because they're going to need that time to to get from one point to the other so if you're going to go do a bath then maybe you show a cue card you know just a laminated part of the bath like you don't have to use simple phrases two words bath you don't have to use any words you show the bath and then you, we we have um learned that one of the things that really help with giving baths um is to, it's called a bath poncho. It, it literally looks like a poncho. It's made of a towel and it, it gives the person um, some dignity in, in the caregivers can bathe underneath the towel or um, even move a little bit of the towel at one time and clean that area and put it back. It just gives them a security. Again, there's something around them. They're not exposed. Um, it makes them feel safe. Yeah, I think the other thing about the poncho, and certainly in my experience with some of the difficulties with getting people to bathe, is the shower. They yes. don't want that water hitting them. And so the poncho is just a really nice device to stop that sensation. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit at the end more about some communication recommendations, but even the language of letting someone know what it is that's going to be happening you know, i'm laura i'm your caregiver today i'm here to give you a bath and then just wait you know give a minute for that information or that connection or engagement to just take a little bit of hold so that you're introducing both in words and then maybe showing as melissa's describing or having a washcloth or a towel something that might um, prompt or trigger what it is that, that is going to be happening. Um, anxiety is a symptom where someone is worrying about things that they imagine and can't control. Uh, so how, how awful that is. And the behavior manifests in this nervous energy, or maybe it's an external communicating of worry. Uh, you can look at someone and see it on their face or how their, their body language is. Um, and so with anxiety, um, one of the things we talked about and, and we try to offer as a recommendation is to bring someone back to the present moment. You know, and how can you do that? Well, there's many ways through music, having um, some favorite song or um, you know, something that's either playing in the background, you begin to sing to kind of bring them back into that present. Um, maybe it's uh, taking a walk. Uh, again, it's so varied where you are and what you're able to do, but just kind of the overall general ideas of um, if someone is worried or they can't control something in the future, bring them back into that present moment. Uh, maybe take a look out a window and see if there's a hummingbird uh, or something that you can watch. Um, Melissa and I had a wonderful um, experience in caring for someone who introduced us to a Buddhist concept known as a Dharma box. And essentially it was just a box where you would gather favorite mementos, a treasured object, a photo that's meaningful to uh, the person that you're caring for. And in those moments of maybe excess worry or anxiety that you're picking up on, bring out the box, mm -hmm. you know, open up and present one of the, the items from there and see if it doesn't help to just divert or to comfort, uh, to calm someone. Um, again, it's all time back to what has been said, that inability to self-initiate mm -hmm. is 
um, very much, and we know this, that's why there's the book, 36 hour day, and you could probably say it's even more than that, um, but it does challenge um, anyone who's in this role as a caregiver to be creative mm -hmm. and to be thinking a little bit, you know, a step ahead. So if you can understand and anticipate that these might be some of the um, symptoms that are arising from changes, you can be a little bit more prepared. Um, and then finally, what we always love and talk about here is um, a quiet moment. Sometimes just your presence, reaching out of the hand. Hello. Um, not saying anything at all, just being with someone and sometimes well, holding anxiety. space. Holding the space, of yes. And I, I that phrase. On the, on the anxiety, I can, you can probably all relate, but needing, again, going back to having some kind of security object and they don't self-initiate. So this is something you're going to have to put in there for them. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, even before this started, I needed my help, um, my anxiety. <laughs> I needed some of Peggy's coffee. And again, I like just having to hold it. It's something real when, you know, when you lose your place, you get nervous, you have that anxiety, you have something to hold. Um, so we, I mean, and again, maybe you put a bunch of different things. We, mm -hmm. we have the, the dolls that I love, and we also have other things that you put out there and you just see what they kind of gravitate toward. Mm -hmm. And then you encourage that security because that's a way of, of allowing them to, to control their own anxiety without even needing you at some point, possibly. Um, and then finally, we'll finish up with apathy, which is this symptom. It's, it's like an inability to perceive and remember the future. And the behavior, what that sometimes looks like is what we're talking about, um, uh, you know, that lack of self-initiation or that response to maybe seeming like, oh, I'm not bothered by um, uh, this person today because they're just sitting quietly. But sometimes if that sort of goes on for a longer period or every day, that's the same, that's almost a reflection of more of that person's own um, self um, worry or behavior that they are not sure even what to do. So it can come to them not doing everything. And that might lend back to more of that sensory deprivation that you were talking about. So um, the environment's so important, right? Creating. And how, I mean, we all know this in our, it's our home. We want it to reflect who we are and we want to feel safe in it. So what do you do to make your home feel like yours? You, you put this, the candle that smells good and, and you take the, you know, you put on the classical music or maybe it smiles and there's four kids yelling and screaming everywhere. Or with Peggy's house, it smells good and you want to eat whatever is in her cooking. kitchen. Exactly. Yes, it's the taste and smell. And then again, the touch, it's your blanket, it's your sofa. So engage that loved one that's apathetic through, through ways that you can make their environment reflect who they are. And, and knowing too, and I, I just know, I want to keep saying this, you know, choose one of the things and maybe you yeah. do it for a month because it can be so exhausting that right? you're coming to it already wiped out. Um, but maybe just another way to think about if you set up um, or change a little bit in the environment, uh, you're likely to see some reduction or some, you know, wait for it and see what happens. Yeah. And what I love about yeah. us is we all bring our own experiences and our own objective view. And we discuss, we, we discuss our patients together collectively because again, I'm going to see it one way and, and everybody else is going to see it another way. So, and it's very much so with your own loved ones, it's hard to step back. So that's where you have people like us that can help um, when, when you may not, you just may not know, you just don't have the ability to be objective. I wonder if Peggy, you might want to tell the story of how you had to sing on your walks. Oh, oh that's a really terrible oh, yeah. So you when, use of music. Yeah, you know, actually I have a couple of good ones from <laughs> music, but with my father, he, um, he was a very religious man and he didn't have any language skills anymore. Mm -hmm. And I would visit him and we, but he could walk very well and he was always a active guy. So I'd take him out for a walk. And he, as long as I sing hymns, and I, I trust me, I sing everything ever. And he would be happy to be on a walk and he was very calm. 
as soon as I ran out of songs, <laughs> he got very, very anxious. He started looking around for the door because he knew he was hopeless mm -hmm. of how to get back. And it was so obvious. It was just, it was amazing. But, you know, the hymns just were, he was fine. It wouldn't matter where he was as long as he heard a hymn, he was happy. And it's your way of connecting. What a beautiful memory that you have. It wasn't strapping him down to a bed. You know, I mean, which, which could have gone a whole different way, but you got to connect and keep that memory. Yeah. Yeah. And we also, um, we want to say too that we know we know that we like to try all of these oh, things and course. do our best to not use medications and not do anything like that but we know that behaviors can and we see that too oh absolutely it, nothing we do works it's mm -hmm. too difficult to manage or maybe there is pain or anxiety that is is real organic to me yeah. and, and we try medication but it's yeah. even not enough Right. So we want to do, actually, we want to say if we have ideas for future webinars to let us know in the chat, but that we were going to, we want to say that for another webinar. Basically, when, when these, all these things we try don't work and the behavior's just too difficult or it's dangerous or there's uh, kind of things being made into weapons and things like that. We want to say we'd like to address that. We have one question. Someone wanted to know uh, what the author of the book, I'm Still Here. That's John Ziesel. We can put him on our website too. Yeah. Or if you can chat it. So let's, let's kind of wrap uh, up for. Do we have time for that part? Uh, oh my oh, can yeah. we show the art? So, no, you know, okay. So there's a couple of stories. We have so many stories, oh, so of, many stories. of various people, but um, most recently was a gentleman who's a um, physicist, and he was he always did crossword puzzles and he liked outdoor scenes and he has all he put them on boards. He has 50 of these and he's very proud of them and shows them to me and um the our art guy katie came and i'm not sure that he's ever done any drawing per se in his life and she said well what do you she comes with a bunch of things and says well what what do you want to do here and so he picks out what he wants and she sits with him and draws as well and gives him tips if he wants otherwise he, he's made two really, I mean, fantastic drawings um, of, of nature. And, you know, I don't, his wife was absolutely astounded. <laughs> and, um, you know, and it's a great way for him to engage because he has a lot of anxiety when he has to be on the move all the time. So this is a way that he actually has to slow down and concentrate. It's one hour. And he does, and it's changed the lives. I mean, it's really been quite dramatic. So. And Peggy, does he know if you asked him who the president was, would he know who the president was? Um, he might. It's hard to say. You don't have to be highly functional. You know, no. To, to you just it. have to yeah. be open and yeah. willing. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I had another lady. This was my first experience in, like, she was end stage dementia no language but she swore a stormtrooper and her <laughs> poor daughter was so embarrassed and would always apologize it's like no we didn't care i mean it didn't mean anything to us but she said she had never heard a swear word out of her mother's mouth her entire life so and she was extremely um aggressive and I mean, she would hurt people trying to bathe and get dressed. And one day I went by and there was a music person there and I watched this woman and she's singing the songs. Mm -hmm. And I've never heard a word out of her mouth except for a swear word. Mm -hmm. And she knew every single word. It was like, 
the big light bulb went off oh, and what? you know i said okay we're singing and so Ooh, we amazing. found some songs that she knew and when it was time to go for a bath you start singing the songs when it was time to get dressed you sing the songs and she loved bicycle built for two and everybody <laughs> knew that and it was it was magical i mean i could not believe the difference in her ability to walk away with those things so it, it was that was my first little aha moment Uh, did you want to wrap us up with the last five minutes of yeah. connection and talk a little bit more about some recommendations for communication? Um, I think it was on our um, flyer, you know, that experience when um, someone is repeating um, a question over and over or um, they are asking about something that you know to no longer be um, true or able to be um, you know happening and one of the most distressing experiences is needing to respond uh, to the reality or worldview of a loved one when it does not at all resemble you know what you know to be true um, and often i uh, think about this you know if we attempt to get someone to change how they see the world whether or not they have uh, or cognitive disorder or not, um, often the response is one of either you know, anger or resistance, or you don't understand me. Um, and so, you know, the better recommendation is in those moments to try and respond to the feelings uh, of what it is that's being said um, and, and underlying what another is saying as the way to find that path. Um, my example is going to be, you know, someone who's constantly asking where a deceased relative is. Um, this is very distressing. <laughs> uh, I hear many, many times um, for all involved, you know, where is uh, my husband? When is John coming home? Maybe? Whatever it may be. Um, and so, you know, even just to, to try, and again, it's going to be um, based on the situation and other things but maybe take that chance to speak to the feelings and rather than feel the need to give a practical real life answer, whether it's to say, oh no, don't you know that you know John died three months ago, which will have someone possibly be living that experience. We could just offer and say, you must really be thinking of John today. You must really be missing him. Um, and maybe that's where you can uh, use diversion or distraction or invite them to look at and pull in something else. Exactly. Pull in something else or invite them some comfort object or see if you can um, engage in some discussion uh, rather than feeling that you have to orient back to the reality. Um, so that's, you know, one example. The other thing too, we thinking about is in communicating to allow space for emotional honesty. And what we kind of mean by that is honesty equating to being yourself and allowing sometimes um, for your own feelings to come through. So if you're feeling sad or you're feeling overwhelmed or you're feeling happy, um, let the other person that you're in, as a partner with or you're um, caring for, know that and say, you know, I'm feeling sad today too, or I'm missing so-and-so. Because what that allows for is for there to be sort of a mutual, uh, beautiful giving and taking of care. So that it's not always that you have to necessarily hide your feelings because, oh, I don't want to overwhelm someone or they shouldn't see that I'm feeling so down because that'll upset them. Um, sometimes uh, as you're trying to connect, you can take a chance, a little bit of vulnerability in it, but you can allow um, your own honest feeling to come through. And it might be you end up sharing a laugh um, and having some fun or someone, I, I remember this uh, one time with Kathleen, my mother-in-law, how she reached out a hand to me because I think I was just totally <laughs> feeling at the end of the rope. 
and you know you weren't expecting it you think oh i don't even know that she's even there with me and then she <laughs> did something um you know that she would have done in the past so there was that connection um and then finally just a last recommendation uh in trying to build a better communication and connections is to eliminate um if you can that you're asking someone to tell you like can you tell me or can you remember it's um like a test of you know and it can feel like a test of memory to someone and probably nine out of ten times they're gonna fail the test <laughs> and you're not rebuilding anything by continuing to do this right exactly keep their memory there no exactly and so um what you can do is give the answer um rather than ask questions so the way that might sound is you know hi mom you know this is your granddaughter sophia and you'd like to read to her and then invite the exercise you know invite the activity or um you know just saying uh remember how much fun we used to have when we would go uh you know, fishing or having that vacation at the lake, and you offer and invite uh, the openings of that memory, so that you're not having to test or have them remember. Right. Right. Do you remember, honey? Right, because then for a moment they might not. That um, creates a behavior as yeah. an anxiety. Yeah. And as patient. So this is a way to just um, just kind of offer the information um, rather than waiting um, and doing that testing. So just a, another thought uh, of a recommendation. Of um, we will wait a few minutes for anyone to type questions into the chat. We'd love to hear um, any questions you all have. And we want to say that a lot of the sensory stuff that we use and have, Brittany and Jeannie, uh, part of our team has put it all on our website so you can look at that, that stuff too, which is helpful. What do you think about the AI animated pets? Oh, they're wonderful. Oh, oh my goodness, so lifelike. <laughs> uh, there's definitely been times I didn't know if it was a real cat or not. <laughs> so they're amazing. Yeah, I've seen good things with it. I have a little 95 year old lady right now who has a dog and it's not all AI, but it barks and it wags its tail and she just beams when she has that dog yeah. and she's named it. And so we always have to address the dog when we see her and she and, and she says, I know it's not. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. The lady with the cat, it hisses at me when I, so it, it, I, was, I didn't know it could do that, but yes, it, it does. So we think they're yes. great. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And even, yeah. Uh, even I had a hold up to them because I, I said, well, they're going to know it's not real. Oh, so yeah. that doesn't, it doesn't matter. matter. Right. Even if, whether they, whether they mm -hmm. think it's real or not, it it's has no comfort. bearing on whether they're going to like there's some interaction. Right. How would you have someone introduce the item? I think I think it's good to what I've learned the best is what I always think might help, it doesn't. So <laughs> putting it out there, you know, and I wouldn't overly, you know, just give them too many things, but laying it in their presence where they might pick something up or, or notice it. And then you can kind of see what they gravitate towards mm -hmm. and, and, and go in that route. I, I love the the baby dolls. Um my mom made this one for a lady. She's a Seahawks fan, um, but it, you can rip off the thing. And again, this, you might, right, right. You may think it's childish, but try to empty your cup and, and saying that we all have our own securities, whether it be Starbucks or a doll or our favorite blanket, everybody needs that and deserves that. So you, you just yes, right. meet them where they are. Yes. Any more final questions, or um, even if you, if anyone wanted to type into the chat um, topics they would be interested in for future mm -hmm. webinars from us? And email us. We love this. We can talk about it all day. Yes. <laughs> as long as Peggy keeps making coffee. And we must say, given the inaugural nature of this one being the first, 
We so thank everyone for their patience for joining yeah. us, for your patience, for letting us, um, you know, find our own rhythm and our own ways to best connect. Um, you know, only onward from here. You know, for future webinars. I, actually, I was thinking one last quote. I always love the poet Maya Angelou. She says, "People will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget." I made them feel. Thank you all. Thank you so much to all of our yes. panelists. Yeah. Thank all you, all you guys. And to Brittany. Yeah. And, and to Jenny, <laughs> our doing yeah. the yeah. <laughs> And thank you all so, so much for coming today. Yes. yes. Everyone who took time to spend with us. Thank you. Thank you.